Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our community conversation on cancer, reducing tobacco use in Latinx communities, reaching Latino communities with effective tobacco cessation messaging campaigns. The Community Conversations on Cancer series is presented by Wilmot Cancer Institute's Office of Community Outreach and Engagement in collaboration with the Community Cancer Action Council, or CCAC. The CCAC is made up of organizations and individuals throughout upstate New York that are working with communities today to lessen the impact of cancer tomorrow. This webinar series is charged with bringing information on cancer and cutting edge cancer care to both the community and healthcare providers with a focus on health disparities. This live event has been approved for one AMA PRA category one credit by U of R's School of Medicine and Dentistry, accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education. No commercial funding was re received to support this activity and no commercial interests have been disclosed by our presenters or planners. Now, please join me in welcoming Maria Otero. Maria is the Executive Director of New Mexico's Community Health Worker Association. She has dedicated her career to promoting social justice, dismantling oppression, and empowering communities to have a voice in their own health. Dr. Paula Cupertino, Director of Community Outreach and Engagement for Wilmot Cancer Institute, Maria's friend and colleague, will now share a little bit more information about Maria. Dr. Cupertino, if you could tell us more about Maria Otero. She gr has grounded her career on this cancer disparities on uh, her upbringing. Her father was a farm worker uh, in California, and he worked in the time of the grape strikes led by Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. She uh, also grounds her career on her mother who has dedicated her life to take care of the family. Uh, Maria got an award uh, in a scholarship to, uh, to the University State of New, Me New Mexico uh, in a runner uh, scholarship. And one of the reasons for that is that uh, the state of Chihuahua, it's well known for all of you who are runners as the, uh, you know, where the Talmaras, uh, indigenous uh, community that runs without shoes throughout La Sierra's the Chihuahua. So uh, she has done the study of her DNA and she knows that she has uh, a strong influence from the Talmaras, the indigenous population in the border of, of Mexico. I know Maria for 10 years or maybe more. And, you know, he has a strike. And I think we have a lot to learn today from Maria as she, um, she was part of the NCI designation uh, in New Mexico and she uh, led the community reach and engagement uh, implementation that informed the associate director with the, uh, the designation and they were very successful. Uh, Maria has brought together two communities uh, and I think uh, her work bringing the Native American community and the Latino community, uh, we have a lot to learn on how to bring uh, communities impacted by cancer together. Uh, she uh, developed and adapted the uh, NCI Cancer 101 and clinical trial curriculum for training of community health worker. Uh, and she did a beautiful work in the linguistic many, many years ago. Um, she's also a leader in the all of us uh, in an effort to have to reach a 1 million samples DNA and uh, one of her roles is to increase disparities uh, in diversity in that effort, in the U.S. effort. She is the executive director of one of the largest state-initiated community health worker uh, infrastructure in New Mexico. Uh, so as the executive director, she leads uh, more than 600 community health workers. It's one of the largest network of community health workers. Uh, and you know, uh, she's going to talk to us uh, today also about her efforts in developing culturally and linguistic uh, a marketing campaign. And today she's going to talk about her uh, uh, effort in a $2 million campaign that she, as a policy and advocate, got the state of New Mexico to fund to increase utilization of the quit line. Maria, I can be here hours. Maybe I can give you a talk, just talking about the amazing work you have done in cancer prevention control. And uh, with that, welcome 
Thank you, Dr. Cortino. Um, it's an honor for me to be here with all of you uh, this morning. And, uh, you know, I want to thank you and, and your staff for, for having me here today. And um, I am excited to be here with you guys. Um, and um, I would like to keep this conversation informal because I think that's part of like how we learn better than than very structured. So, you know, I was very optimistic that I was going to be able to share all our work, but we only have li very limited time. But I want to make sure that I, I do uh, thank uh, Wilman um, Cancer Institute for having me and yes. you, uh, having you, you here, uh, Dr. Cupertino. Um, I'm going to start, um, I'm going to share my slides here. Um, so I can um, uh, do a little bit. And, and yeah, the topic of my presentation, I call it, you know, health equity beyond translation in reaching the Hispanic communities, uh, effective tobacco cessation messages campaigns. Um, but uh, let's see here. Let's see if I can do this. Yes. And at this time, I don't have any dis uh, to disclose anything. And just to give you a little bit of more information of who we are um, and sharing you, you know, I want to share some background information about the New Mexico Community Health Workers Association. Uh, it was founded in 1995 uh, and it's the First Nations um, Association of Community Health Workers. And I feel very proud that I get to lead this organization where so many of the states learn from our experience and we help other, uh, other states uh, to begin their own associations of community health workers. Uh, we know that the association uh, continuously provided support to build skills, uh, capacity of, advocate for, and empower community health workers in our state. Uh, community health workers, uh, have been the frontline um, essential workforce uh, in the fight against health inequities uh, for many, many decades and are critical to our efforts to chronic disease prevention. Our mission at Nuestra Salud, which is uh, our health, that what it means, uh, it is, uh, to uh, in, uh, is to reduce health disparities affecting communities in New Mexico and the nation through our research, training, and outreach. And I just want to say that Nuestra Salud Health Network is a statewide network uh, that uh, we have community members advise all of our work that we do at, at the association. Um, I would like to, um, let's see here. I would like to share this information, um, you know, begin this discussion by acknowledging our network members. Um, these are, you know, many of the volunteers uh, who mobilize our communities. Uh, as we all know that heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and stroke are the most common causes of illness and disability um, and death affecting the growing number of people in our communities. We know many, many of these uh, chronic conditions tend to be more common uh, diagnosed later uh, as a result in worse outcomes for a particular individual such as, um, um, you know, people of color like this photo, uh, people with income injustices and other whose life conditions place them at a uh, risk for poor health um, that is focused in uh, for our work. And we know that despite the efforts to reduce and eliminate health disparities, they still persist. Um, and in some cases, um, they have the widening among some population groups. Um, and we know such disparities have no single cause. Um, they have created and maintained through multiple interconnected and complex pathways. Um, we know that there are several factors that influence the health and contribute to uh, health disparities, including the root causes, or, you know, as we know them, the social determinants of health, such as poverty, uh, the lack of education, racism, and discrimination, but also the behavioral factors that happen, such as diet and tobacco use. Um, at, at the association and our health network and Nuestra Salud, we believe that health equity 
uh, means that every person has the opportunity to achieve optimal health, uh, regardless of their color of their skin, their level of education, their language they speak, uh, their, their gender identity, their sexual orientation, um, uh, you know, of course, the job that they have, that neighborhood they live in, and whether or not they have a disability. And uh, while health disparities can address multiple levels, we're focusing on policy, systems, and environmental improvement strategies uh, designed to improve places where people live, people, you know, where they learn, where they work, you know, like at the farm workers going into the fields, going into those dairies, working with the business people in order to provide this education, but also where people and families uh, spend time um, in their, uh, with their families. Um, Today, I'm going to just give you, uh, there's four things that I would like to share today. You know, I'm just going to give you all a very quick background of the New Mexico population. I want to talk about Equity Lane's view of the barriers uh, to effective, effectiveness of the Main Street evidence-based interventions. And I'm going to try my best to give you all these examples of ev the evidence-based approaches or interventions that we've done, like the media campaign. We have a... Um, um, a, a project that uh, for a, a um, photo voice project, and then also the uh, community health workers trainings that we're providing our community health workers in New Mexico as well. And then I can just, um, you know, provide, um, discuss some of the things that we've learned with the media campaigns and some of the formative research that we, that we did um, with our groups. Um, so, you know, New Mexico, uh, Hispanic and Spanish speaking population is very large in New Mexico. I don't know if you guys know, but New Mexico is the fifth largest state in landmass with only 2 million people. And when I say that, a lot of people is like, oh my God, yeah, we know you work big, but we only have 2 million people. And even just that puts us out as a frontier in a rural community just across everywhere where you go. I'm very lucky that I live in central uh, New Mexico, where you know it takes me three to four hours to get to ooh, the southeast of the uh, of the state, or four hours to go northwest. You know, so it, it is. Um, you know, we have a lot of land to really cover in order to reach our community members. But uh, nearly one million people—that's like forty-eight percent of the state's population—you know—consider themselves Hispanic, are Hispanic. And 29% of the state's total population say they speak Spanish at least half of the time at home. Uh, and that's more than uh, half a million people. Uh, and also about 150,000 people say they speak English less than very well. We know they're very diverse. Uh, two thirds of our uh, population is from Mexican he heritage. But there's also, you know, the rest is from Puerto Rico, Cuban, and multiple countries in Central and South America. We know that, uh, like every, everywhere else, Latinos uh, face many barriers in healthcare. We compare, you know, English versus Spanish speaking Hispanics, and we know that Spanish speaking Hispanics have, um, you know, are more likely to experience poverty. And also, you know, they are less likely to have access to uh, health coverage. Um, and then, um, as I mentioned before, uh, about 500,000 um, people in New Mexico uh, residents are, you know, speak, speak uh, Spanish at home. Among them, um, around 16% uh, of adults smoke cigarettes. And meaning that approximately that's like 60,000 uh, Spanish speaking adults are at risk for tobacco related harm. Um, in fact, there was a recent statewide health survey that indicated that 77% of Spanish speaking adults, uh, uh, people who smoke in New Mexico, reported trying to quit in the last year, which it's uh, significantly more than English speaking Hispanics with. 63% uh, or the general uh, population. 
So we believe, like in our organization and in our state, we believe in partnerships as an evidence-based intervention to build uh, support healthy com communities. Both the New Mexico Department of Health Tobacco Use Prevention and Control Program, I'm going to call it TUPAC for short, okay? Um, and as we work to really, uh, we know, we work on important health issues, on different issues. Um, of course, the tobacco uh, control program has different evidence-based strategies that, you know, that include the free telephone and web-based uh, support through quick line coaches in English and in Spanish. They have NRT um, uh, medication, but also they use the quality improvement approaches to improve the effectiveness using an equity lens. And that's always uh, trying to do it not just once a year, but continuously to, in order for us to really do an effective uh, work. Mm -hmm. At Nuestra Salud, uh, as you already know, our health network, we engage Hispanic and Latino community leaders and stakeholders uh, through our, throughout the state, but also um, community members, which are very powerful. Ultimately, I think as researchers or uh, working with community, we want to target people or, you know, but these are the people that are going to help us move our uh, our work together. So for us, that has been a priority to work not just with community-based organizations or state organizations, but also the community themselves. We hear them in, in you know, in, in many things that, that we do. And we, you know, uh, and we currently, like I said, um, uh, we are part of the New Mexico Community Health Workers Association. So uh, viewing the evidence through um, an equity lens, I think sometimes um, the evidence base uh, doesn't work for a specific population and that's including the Hispanic people. And this is why uh, I think uh, sometimes translations um, can be done very poorly. You've probably seen that. Uh, especially for our uh, peers here that are bilingual, you probably see like, oh my God, who translated that? What does that mean? Uh, but even if if, um, if you get to the point that of, of, of what you're trying to say, you know, sometimes the messages are, you know, it doesn't get in uh, to the right people or it's very effective. Um, and this is especially true when the topic is difficult, uh, when one, where's a lot of community and personal values coming to play, like health and, 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 um, and addiction. But even a high quality like, like translation, like I said, it won't help the intervention. It's just not designed with a culture and context in a community in mind. So just translating... Uh, information from an evidence-based intervention from English to other languages that doesn't guarantee that it's going to reach and be effective to other language or other cultures. Um, and that is why we need to always work with those community members that are working um, uh, in those communities who is they're intended for. Um, so we're applying an equity lens uh, to the states, uh, New Mexico, tobacco control work across, you know, everything that we do under uh, tobacco control. And we try to evaluate whether something is working or something's not working, uh, but also whether the intervention is reaching people in, effective, in an effective from the perspective of the different communities that we serve. Part of that includes whether messages are meaningful to the community, uh, but um, if they make sense or other things that have important to the community. I think it's also so critical that um, the delivery of the intervention is supportive. Uh, for example, I think we use this a lot, but for example, just mandating that a public housing or a multi-unit housing facility goes smoke-free without any discussion with the residents. Uh, may be very uh, may be effective, you know, or support among residents may, may may be effective, but it also could be very oppressive and disempowering for people who are affected. Um, and this kind of approach uh, will not encourage people to take control of their own health and in, in their life. And I think that's the approach that that we use. 
Um, so what I'm going to share with you, it's the, the Hello Ya campaign. Like I said, I had all this work, but I think I can just like focus on one. So if there's any questions, that would be great. I think I want to stop talking a lot so we can start the conversation of how we do things. But um, so we actually adapted um, this, uh, the Hello Ya campaign, which promotes the tobacco free quit line. Um, and we know that tobacco or telephone quit lines are recommended as best practice by CDC, uh, of course, and they have been proven uh, to be a success by of quitting tobacco. And um, originally, the, the quit line in New Mexico was launched in 20, 2005 as part of the state, you know, that two-pack program. Um, and it and provides like, you know, the different um, nicotine replacement therapy. Uh, all of this information can be found in the, uh, in a, we published a recent article in uh, health promotion practice. If, if you would like to um, you read more about it, it's, it's available and it's free. So, um, but you can see it. So, uh, so we saw that actually the Department of Health saw that there was a gap um, that, uh, first of all, I think, um, well, let me see, go back. I already started with that, but I, I think it's a, um, the Department of Health saw a gap having a large Hispanic population and having Spanish speakers not calling the quit line. And we saw they said, oh, you know, it's, um, why is this happening? How come uh, Spanish speakers are not calling the quit line? What, what is it? We need to investigate that. But we know that um, overall, I think the evidence is that Hispanic um, uh, people who smoke and are Hispanic, they're less likely to um, to you know to call any any of the quit lines. So we know that, um, and we don't know if this is just. Uh, related to barriers or, you know, enrolling to the service or, or what is it? So we really wanted to investigate uh, the media campaigns and, and making sure that, you know, what was going on. But um, so what we did is that we actually went into New Mexico. Uh, all of our work has always been led by community health workers. We have community health workers across New Mexico that work on different initiatives in, in our work. But I, I, I just wanna say that we did um, 10 focus groups to get all the background information about why people were not, you know, why they're not calling the quit line, what's, what's happening, et cetera. And uh, we were lucky we were able to talk to uh, 96 community members. And um, luckily we had, half of the participants were people who smoke and then the other half was people who didn't smoke. So we have a good representation of both groups. Um, and, you know, we were at local grocery stores. For us, it's so important that we're always uh, are where, um, or be present where community members are instead of people coming into me, to my office where I'm comfortable but we have to get out of our comfort zone, some of us, and go where people are to really, you know, um, uh, help or assist communities with, with resources. So that's what we did. We had um, local churches and uh, we, uh, we have a good collaboration or partnership with a local Mexican markets in New Mexico, all over New Mexico. So, you know, where we have, you know, done um, what is it at resource libraries for, for different um, chronic disease topics. But, so we did that. Um, and then um, with that information, uh, you know, we also ask about the current, uh, their current tobacco uh, media campaign that they had in the state actually just literally translated the 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 media campaign and it had like flowers it had camel what is it camel the camel or what is it called the uh um you know what i'm talking the camel cigarettes has a camel it was that and then it had the malboro men as well and then it had a lot of blooming flowers so when we talk to community members we show the commercial and i said what do you think this commercial it's all about and they're like oh you know what i think uh, it's just, is it Mother's Day? 
Is it a Mother's Day? Because um, it has flowers. They had no clue who camel. The, the camel. yes, thank you. I could not. I couldn't think about Joe. <laughs> Joe the Campbell. So that and then the Malboro man, I remember being a little girl like a long time ago, uh, like knowing about the Malboro man, but then he disappeared in the uh, Spanish speaking media. So we did not know who he was. I knew who he was, but like a lot of people could not identify. So we knew that, you know, this is not happening. And, um, and actually when I started when we started uh, seeing the, the new media campaign, we did not have a Dejelo Ya name in Spanish. It said, quit now. Uh, and then it will say something uh, for Spanish, you know, in Espanol, things that we think they're very simple, but a lot of times we don't think they're important. But like people will, even though it's in English and it will say Espanol, people will not be calling because that's in English. And people did not feel comfortable just calling. So now that we knew that was happening, and then we all know that people thought it was a Mother's Day, you know, commercial, we approached the State Department and said, we need to do something about it to, to do that. And we were very lucky that the State Department of Health had commitment to our community. We were able to, um, uh, what is it, secure funding, for you know a total like i think four years for that campaign to make sure that, it, that it's evaluated so i think it was you know it's a uh, uh it's unique that we were able to do that um but let's see what else um let's see here i don't want to pass my time i want to make sure we have in, enough time so what we did is, like I said, um, we had uh, advice from the community. Um, you know, there, we wanted to make sure that we, how can we increase the knowledge for the quit line? How, the, um, you know, let people know about their services and, and also so important, how can it, it be aligned from our community's values? Not so much like I can be a creative working for a media firm and I think I can be a a uh, creative person that develops these great things, but if they're, they re do not resonate with our community, that really doesn't work. So, um, you know, that that's part of like our work there. So we, you know, like I said, we uh, what we did is that once we had all our findings from our focus groups, we conducted intensive um, training to the media firm, including the literature, uh, what the evidence in literature says about media campaigns to really uh, work on this. Um, you know, we in uh, also the, you know, we recommended that anything that it was for Spanish speaking population, that it has to be developed in Spanish. So they did hire a Spanish native um, speaker to work on the Spanish. So it was just not, um, you know, translating like before because that completely, you know, the translation is great, but the concept is lost. So we did that and, um, you know, that's how we be begin by, uh, with a media campaign. And once we were able to recognize the theme uh, of perseverance or not giving up, uh, when once we identified that, then we'll work together to build a story. And that's including our uh, health network participants and people from the community that help us with this formative research. And that was also a way that they felt that they're part of this campaign and they feel ownership and empower to be able to, for it to be successful. It's their product, it's not my product. It's not the Department of, of Health's product, but it's their product with their messages. So, you know, the media campaign, of course, they started with, um, with uh, several examples and they're, they're there we were you know taking it meeting with a network saying no that doesn't that doesn't resonate we don't like it so we went you know there was a process in, in, of how we did it and this is uh one of the media prints that we have uh it's uh it says willpower fuerza de voluntad and actually it's based on um the u.s civil medal 
um, Leo Manzano. He won second place in track and field uh, in the 2012 uh, Olympics, uh, despite that he lost his coach and his uh, Nike, what is it, um, sponsorship. And um, so uh, that was very difficult. But he, despite that, he continued training internationally and uh, he won second place in the Olympics, which is amazing. And he actually uh, lives part of, you know, the connection with New Mexico is that Leo Manzano it's, uh, lives part of the um, uh, time in New Mexico to train in high altitude. And uh, when we were actually, you know, I was telling, I think, Arlette, that um, um, I was talking to the creative staff saying, oh, where's places to run? So we're like, oh, we can go here and there. And then we said, oh, yeah, our friend Leo Manzano, you know, like we were just talking about Leo. Then he approached us, the creative guys, like, perseverancia, perseverance, perseverance you know, uh, not giving up the willpower. He identified like his story was very close to New Mexico, to his story about it. And that's how, you know, um, we were able to have Leo, uh, see, especially because he's, you know, a spokesperson. I mean, like he's a well-known athlete. He's Mexican-American and he's, you know, like in, um, lives in New Mexico. So he, people recognize him uh, often there. And I just wanted to say very quickly that all our print media is available at the CDC's Prevention Media Campaign Resource Center, including um, radio ads and, and everything. Uh, so I think what I'm gonna do, I'm going to uh, share with all of you guys, I think I need to like stop sharing. And then I'm gonna share the video uh, it's five minutes uh, of like the process of how we did this process. And then um, I would like to probably also share with you guys the, the media. I mean, the 60 second ad, if you guys want to see it. But uh, I just want to say that even, you know, once you can hear the, the what is it? The 60 second ad, even the actor, the voice actor, was so important for community members because they sound like us in Spanish. And it's so common to hear, for example, you know, uh, a campaign from the Department of Health that it's on lead or it's on, you know, on smoking or, or immunizations is very common. But then the person doing the voiceover, it's somebody with an accent in Spanish. Por favor, pra, pra, pra. Right away, people in our community feel like, oh, we're not important because they did not take the time to really, like take the time to do this commercial or this ad for me. You know, it's like, oh, it's it's always a second thought. It, it actually, that was um, our, um, our community members from our health network said that to us. It's like, oh my gosh, we cannot believe this actor is so, great we had like different ones and they're like no he sounds like me so that was very very nice but but okay so i'm gonna share that um let's see i, I hope you guys can hear it i don't know if i tupac for many years now over a decade created multiple campaigns aimed at a variety of audiences through those years we haven't always had the opportunity usually due to resources to create something that's narrowly targeted at a more specific population. 29% of our households in New Mexico speak Spanish as a primary language in the home. If we don't reach them, we're missing out on a large segment of our population who is using the product, who needs the help, but they don't know how to get that help. We in the Spanish speaking community have been lacking a message that was developed strictly for us by us in order to address needs that we have. My native language is uh, Spanish. And when I came to the United States, there was very limited Spanish speaking publications or health information out there. So that was a very big barrier for our own health care. Being a son of immigrants, uh, being married to an immigrant myself, we know the importance of having information 
that is culturally appropriate. You need to understand the message before you are able to uh, take advantage of the information that is out there. Many times a campaign is designed in English, it's thought up in English, it's developed in English, and then it's translated into Spanish. And I think that misses the mark a lot of the time. We really went to, you know, approach uh, Nuestra Salud and asked if we were to develop a culturally appropriate approach to work with Spanish-speaking populations here in New Mexico, what would that look like? In order for us to do that, we needed to make sure that we adapted evidence-based programs. So for us, it was very important for the tobacco control program to find really what strategies will work now in each of the communities. And that's why we conducted focus groups around the state. We went around and talked to key stakeholders and conducted key informative interviews to gather as much data as possible. The key concepts within Hispanic Latino communities that are extremely important to understand in order to reach that population, to really connect with them. Personalismo, familialismo, uh, respeto, confianza, machismo. If you listen to the U.S. media, macho and machismo are negatives. These are negative behaviors. But if you really look at the definition, we need to reclaim these, these terms. The act of being a macho means being a protector, a nurturer, loving those that you care for. McKee Walwork and Company was very willing to work with us and with the research and really take our advice or feedback into account and we were able to eliminate non-relevant approaches and apply uh, themes like familismo and perseverancia all into this end product. By partnering with Nuestra Salud and Tupac and really diving into the research and speaking with the population themselves, one thing that really started becoming clear was that there was a, an insight that immediately kind of jumped to the top, this idea of perseverance. They worked hard and they didn't give up. They were willing to face challenges and overcome them. And even when they failed, to get up and try again. We understood that the research also told us it took up to seven to eight tries to quit smoking or quit using tobacco. And then the creative team um, discovered this athlete who exemplified perseverance in every way who had immigrated here from Mexico. We had a story we could really tell that could communicate perseverance with power. Finding Leo Manzano was creative serendipity. This is not happening anywhere else in the country. New Mexico is the first to take the Heloya and create a unique campaign. With the research, we were able to make this process, this end product, a culturally appropriate message. Something that the, the community will receive because it touches them in the way that they need to be touched, because it speaks to them in a way that they need to be spoken to or spoken with. This is a very emotional time for me because it's very exciting to... Uh... I'm very hopeful that we are creating a campaign that really connects with this population validates the importance that this population has to New Mexico. Empowering that, that community, that Spanish-speaking community to say, we don't need to listen to, to this industry that is unethical in their practices. Okay, I think that was uh, just to give you an idea of what it what it is. I know this uh, media campaign was uh, two million dollars in production from start to end, uh, and we were, like I said, of very fortunate that we were able to to work with the State Department of Health and really com commit to our Latino. Uh, population there to really reach out to them. I'm not going to go into all the details of the outcomes with the evaluation, but uh, we did evaluate the quit line uh, for a, a, a period of four years. And, um, you know, we want to say that when the, uh, the media campaign was launched, uh, we were not prepared. And those are some of the lessons learned that we had that 
uh, we had uh, an increase by 31% of calls by Spanish speaking communities. Uh, we had an increase of 15% for English Latinos or you know, community members. So we know the media campaign not only reach out to the Spanish speaking, but also to the bilingual uh, Hispanic or Latinos. And there was only like an increase by 3% to other, uh, the other population. So we knew that um, our campaign was instrumental uh, in reaching out our communities because we made the message the correct way uh, and with the process. And um, what else I was going to say with the, the media campaign? Oh, yeah. So also, since we had a lot of calls, uh, the quit line was not prepared to have Spanish uh, speaking uh, coaches, for example. And so we had to really organize. So now as a standard of care or, you know, quality improvement, they're actually like um, prioritized language. Uh, at the state level to make sure that nobody, you know, like they don't have to be waiting for, you know, for, for support. But uh, the first year, the state as, uh, you know, they have allocation of funds to do, um, you know, NRT and they completely ran out of funds because of that. So we know that it was great, but we also know that we have to be, um, what he said, um, uh, refreshing media campaigns. So that's why we were able to uh, provide it to the other states through CDC, other resource centers, so other states can use our campaign. And I know that uh, for sure all, uh, there's a couple or three states that they, they have used our campaign as well in our materials to just refresh. Uh, currently, Leo Manzano is still our spokesperson, and we're doing other types of videos and other, you know, now that not so much we have TV, but we have social media, and we have, you know, people don't watch, uh, I think people are watching more Netflix and other stuff than, like, local TV, so we're, like, trying to, to assess that, but I think that's uh, all I have as, ah, oh, yeah, let me see, let me see if I can, uh, uh, and show, let me see if I can find it here. So, then I think it's this one. Se llama Leo Manzano, medallista olímpico, Le dicen el león. Y no por ser el más grande, el más fuerte, o por seguir invicto, ya que ha conocido la derrota varias veces. Entonces, ¿por qué lo Se llama Leo Manzano. Medallista olímpico. Le dicen el león. Por su determinación. Y no por ser el más grande. Para seguir adelante y perseverar ante todo. Por eso, si has tratado de dejar de fumar y fracasado, no te rindas. El más fuerte, estás un paso más cerca por seguir de lograrlo. Invicto. Marca ya que ha conocido la derrota varias veces. Déjelo ya o visita. Déjelo ya. No sé por qué lo conocen como león. Habla con un coach y obtén tu programa Simple. personal, parches, pastillas y chicles de nicotina gratis por su esperas? determinación y coraje para seguir adelante y perseverar ante todo. Por eso, si has tratado de dejar de fumar y fracasado, no te rindas. Estás un paso más cerca de lograrlo. Marca al 1855 déjelo ya o visita déjelo ya nm.com. Habla con un coach y obtén tu programa personal, parches, pastillas y chicles de nicotina gratis. ¿Qué esperas? So that's just. Uh, um... You know, I know it's in Spanish, but I don't know if you guys could hear even the voice actor. It sounded like very um, like us when we speak Spanish. And, you know, that was just one of the highlights of like our formative research that, yeah. that we did. But So thank you, Maria. No, you're welcome. You know, I'll, I have so many questions. Oh, gosh, uh, okay. You know, um, all of us campaign a national uh, effort to get samples from a million, uh, you know, uh, get the biosample of a million uh, people. 
people <laughs> and in your work in the diversity. You know, I also would love to ask you more about how you have been able to get so close to the policymakers and get the health department to invest $2 million in a, a campaign to focus on 30% on of the yeah. population. Love to hear more about how, you know, you have this impact at the national, state, but also very close to the community, to the community health workers, and even learn how did you get the lion and leon oh, from Hollywood yeah. it, it, to it, come it, to your but let me get to the questions in the chat right okay. apparently you have an influence in hollywood as well so uh <laughs> let's look at some questions here what from your perspective has been the most challenging uh in reaching older adults and first generation citizens to self-advocate engage in and participate in their own health care Okay, so first, I think we need to understand that in our culture, hierarchy is very important and very, uh, it's part of our um, cultural factors, you know, familismo, respeto, confianza, respect, uh, personal relationships that we have. And I think it's, um, and it's, I think it's part of, of um, what we need to understand when we work with community members, because Oftentimes, you know, like I don't self-advocate for myself, but I know that if my doctor is telling me just because he is the doctor and I'm a farm worker or I am an underserved population member, I, um, that, um, you know, that doctor has a lot of influence on my health. And how many times do we have providers that they don't have time to, you know, to talk to, to the provider? So in my experience, it's like, working with community members to of course empower them to become active participants and i think that's part of like the whole process for for me as an individual um person is to help as many people as uh, as possible to empower them to really be active in the healthcare and and that means so many things right um so it's um it is challenging but i think also our work has been very meaningful and important when we talk about the power of partnerships. Um, I think, you know, my work, you know, I feel very fortunate and privileged that uh, I have partners since, you know, I think 28 years ago that I still work with them. And it's uh, finding those partners that really having a commitment to, to the community. Because if I can be a partner, I can be a partner with everybody, but I'm a very picky partner, you know, that I'm going to make sure that we have mutual uh, collaboration. So the other question, it's about the distrust of the community, you know, on the fact that the translation, it's not appropriate or a campaign or a research project are not addressing the you know, their values or their culture. So how do you overcome the distrust that well, it's there? So I think it goes also like that distrust. I think I mentioned it earlier a little bit that even just listening to community members of the recommendations, you know, it's, it's huge to build that trust with your community members. Second, I do believe, you know, through our All of Us research project that we are collaborating uh, together with uh, NIH and La Alianza Hispana Nacional de Salud, we actually, you know, have to have those uh, personal relationships and that is part of our culture, you know, like the personal relationships. I'm here to help you, to help provide you with some information because there's a personal relationship in the confianza and trust in, in our in the work that we do. Does it does yeah. it make sense? So I think it's part of um you know listening to people, uh being present where people are, meeting people where they are. I think I mentioned that we have partnerships with uh, Mexican markets, for example, to meet people where they are instead of them coming into my office to a focus group, for example, but we are gonna be there. And then I think it's um following up with our community members, you know, this is a mutual 
a mutual work that we do. You know, they come with us. Um, so I need to make sure that when I, I do my formative research, I go back to my community and say, this is what you created, this is yours. And that is the voice that we give our community members. And that's part of like our photo voice project that we want to empower people um, to speak for the, themselves with, with their providers. Great, I don't know, any questions here in the room from Maria? Yes. So when you're listening to community voices, which is, I think it's so beautiful and the story of going from the focus groups all the way to the marketing campaign, is so incredible. How do you navigate when communities have different perspectives on how the message should be framed? or what the biggest priorities are? I think, you know, first of all, I think, um, and I think I've been saying this uh, sometimes that, yeah, I, I feel that uh, tobacco is a priority for me, tobacco control is a priority for me, but not necessarily is a priority for the community because there's so other um, income injustices or, you know, other, um, other, uh, what is it other indicators that are that I think it is but it's just like having a conversation and that's when you know like like I said chronic diseases they're all interconnected that if I'm talking about cancer I'm talking about tobacco control because it's related if I'm talking about asthma I'm talking about tobacco control so if I'm talking to you know parents that have asthma you know, uh, children with asthma and uh, due to secondhand smoke or thirdhand smoke, that's how we correlate all these interconnected um, diseases. Did I? And, and also, how do you bring together, you know, if you can give some example, the Native American community with the Latino community through the community health workers or developing kids? So, so uh, I think the, the model that we use, you know, to bring people together, you know, when I was working at the University of New Mexico as the director for health disparities there for Latino community, I started as um, building that program for Native American communities, uh, mobile, um, you know, community health work, working with community health workers, but also community health representatives who, re, who serve the Native American communities. And I think that's part of like building the infrastructure of working with community members, having a model that the community members is a connection, um, you know, between the institution in 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 um in the in the community health worker the yeah. you know that and i think you know we talk many times about you know if you build like you said around the model and principles you know of trust and and you know you bring different communities around the table to work yes. together what is the ideal right instead of um i do want to ask you about your experience to get the research community you know, excited to listen the voices of the community because yeah. definitely something that you do, but how do you get the research community or the cancer control or the cancer researchers and faculty interest and in closer to the community? I think that's the key for, for all of our work that we do. You know, I'm a small researcher doing my own research outside the institution, but still partner with the higher institutions, you know, to for, for us to be able to publish this. But I think the key here is that, you know, it goes back to the previous question that how, you know, it goes back to your question that it goes, how can I ask the researchers to make sure to hear the community? Because, you know, they are the ones that are going to make their work successful by guiding it from, uh, with a community perspective. And I think that's one, the other one is really being present with our community members. I think, you know, my, uh, we know this, that a lot of time research, uh, research institutions will say, yes, I'll be back. And they never go back to those communities. And it's about building these relationships with, uh, with our communities, mm -hmm. with our different communities. Beyond like, a research project. Right. Yes. Beyond a research project. Yes. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, yeah. Tell us about all of us and how is all of us 
working to increase diversity yeah. in their you know, bio samples. Yes, yeah, so uh, the All of Us project, it's a research, it's the biggest research project in, in, in the mm -hmm. world. You know, there is going to be a long-term project for, you know, that they're trying to recruit a million people for of diverse communities. And it is so we have precision medicine, making sure that my, the only, uh, you know, precision medicine example, um, yeah, example is prescription glasses. These are for me, if you put them, it doesn't work. Medications, right now we have so many medications for diabetes, but they only, if one doesn't work, then I try another one. And what they are trying to figure out is that they want participation from all um, ethnicities and groups in order for us to advance medicine. Uh, it was supported by, uh, in 2015, was launched by, um, su with support from President Obama. So we all are informed about that, you know, about that. And so we um, are the leading agency in New Mexico uh, to inform and provide education to community members to participate. We don't recruit, but we help them how to create um, opportunities. And um, I know the University of Register is part of all of us and we're investigating on, on how we can like work together. Yeah, we would love to have yeah. access in this partnership. So I think, you know, I don't know if, uh, don't we don't have other questions and I just want to let the, the audience know that Maria will be here on Friday and Saturday, uh, training, interacting, sharing lesson learned sharing her expertise and so we can continue to learn and do you know similar work or or improve our work here in our communities so thank you maria if anybody has interest you know in, in talking with maria she'll be here at saunders beauty today and tomorrow and thank you for taking time of your busy no, uh, life to no be thank us. you thank you for for the great um <laughs> opportunity yeah. for for it. Thank you, and I see you in the next uh, community conversation. And Christina, uh, I live with you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, to joining today. We will be providing a recording of this to everybody that registered. So if you missed the entirety of this, you will be able to catch up. And please make sure to take the survey following this um, presentation in order so we can see what topics you would like to see next. So thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your week.